Good afternoon. My name is David Kastik of Windover Information, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this, the latest in our series from the Innovators Workbench. Joining me today in our interview of Dr. Simon Sturzer is Paul Yock. Paul is well known to you, a renowned figure in his own right. He is director of the biodesign program here at Stanford and also co-chair of the bioengineering department. You know, for those of you who follow the series, you know that the backgrounds of the folks we've interviewed is wide and varied. And yet, if there is a kind of archetypal medical device entrepreneur, it is that physician who, finding a clinically valuable and important new procedure, finds himself in the position of having developed technology to make that technology, to make that procedure work. And no one better exemplifies that than Dr. Simon Sturzer. Dr. Sturzer is best known to us, many of us in the medical device world for his role at AVE, but he was also a true pioneer in the development of coronary angioplasty as a procedure here in the U.S., and we're fortunate to have him with us. So, Dr. Sturzer, thanks very much for joining us today. And let me just begin by saying that I, I know you're raised in New York. You're actually an East Coaster like me, um, and that uh, your early training uh, was in medicine but was not in cardiology. Where, where did you begin, and what did, how did you get into cardiology as a field? Well, I uh, started out at the University of California in San Francisco in surgery, and um, I got interested in cardiology because uh, cardiovascular surgery was, uh, especially in congenitals and early valve surgery in the very er early 60s, was beginning. And um, I went back to New York because uh, we had a very uh, much more developed uh, mature cardiology fellowship program uh, in, in that era. Now, this is now going back 40 years. And so to say that uh, there wasn't a really uh, well-matured fellowship at the University of California in cardiology in, in, in 1962 is not an insult. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I went back to New York and uh, ran into uh, actually Andre Cornon, who uh, won the Nobel Prize for right heart catheterization mm -hmm. uh, in New York. And I went through the medical program, became chief resident in that uh, institution in NYU and Bellevue Medical Center that at the time had the Columbian Cornell Division in addition. and. Um, uh, of all the subspecialties, uh, uh, the emerging interest of, uh, uh, of one of our attending physicians in invasive cardiology was so intense and so impressive that I became his fellow after chief residency in New York. Was that was Ed Reppert? That was Ed Reppert. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> talk to us a little about where cardiology was at that point and how you became involved and how you got to the point where you were the one to do the first coronary angioplasty in the U.S. Obviously, at some point, you became involved and got became aware of the work that Andres Grunsik was doing. But tell, take us through that uh, history. Well, to make a very long story short, uh, <laughs> uh, I uh, am going to take the, the, uh, uh, the liberty of telling you that, in many respects, the first coronary arteriogram in New York City was done by myself in about 1963 or four. It was about a year after Mason Soans and Shirey wrote their initial paper in 1962. And I can tell you that to do a coronary angiogram uh, uh, 40 years ago, 42 years ago in New York City or anywhere in the United States selectively was a, uh, a remarkably uh, adventurous procedure. In many respects, more so than doing angioplasty in, uh, in 1978, there was a lot better preparation for it than there was for the coronary angiography, which we did on eight millimeter film. Mm -hmm. And I had to run the film, uh, and actually it was 16 millimeter film, and develop it myself by hand. And then we thought it was a tremendous advance uh, to get 35 millimeter motion pictures, never dreaming that you would see DICOM CDs of the, uh, uh, of the caliber that you see today. Uh, however, um, again, to give you an idea of how far cardiology has gone, uh, uh, is to state that at that time when we were trying to introduce coronary angiography into the East Coast and then the, then the West Coast and then all over the country from the Midwest where it began, um, 
there were no coronary care units. Somebody with an acute myocardial infarction went into an open ward. Uh, uh, during my fellowship, I did infants that were newborn in the catheterization laboratory to adults because pediatric uh, uh, catheterization had not yet been separated from mm -hmm. adult cardiology. So that shows you that, in, in essence, as I was saying to Paul Yock before, uh, that you've got yourself a dinosaur here, <laughs> as much as I hate to say it. Well, do, do, but, do you have a sense of what it, what it was in your own practice or, 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 or nature that led you to, to be the first in this space? Did you? understand the trepidation that other doctors had? What was it that you think led you to, to, to go in areas where no other doctors really were going at that time? Uh, well, I think part of it was the influence of Ed Reppert. Ed Reppert uh, uh, was a, um, uh, a pioneer. Uh, his training had come from Walter Reed Army Hospital, and, uh, and this Cornon uh, Walter Reed Army Hospital was the beginning of all invasive cardiology in the, uh, in the 60s. So that uh, for somebody that uh, was always looking out for a new edge to try to understand coronary disease, the first window we got was uh, coronary angiography. And the justification for that, because there was none in 1963-64, people said, why are you doing this? It's just dangerous, and it's of no uh, consequence whatsoever. Well, in 1967, Melvin Judkins came along, made it simpler, and so did Effler at the Cleveland Clinic by doing the first bypass, uh, Effler and Favaloro. And uh, the advent of bypass surgery justified coronary angiography. And so we went on developing uh, coronary angiography as a triage for surgery, which was a monumental advance in internal medicine uh, until about uh, eight or nine years later, um, somebody dumped on my desk uh, some animal work that uh, Andreas Grunzig was uh, struggling with in Zurich and said, what do you think of it? And I said, where is this fellow? And uh, and uh, the person who dumped it on my desk said, well, he's in my apartment on Fifth Avenue right now, but he doesn't speak English. And uh, my German was pretty pathetic, but Andreas learned uh, English very, very quickly. And uh, in 1977, in September, he did the first case in Zurich. And then we went to uh, actually uh, Kaltenbach's lab laboratory uh, for some subsequent very early cases before there were a half a dozen. And finally, uh, after seven uh, trips from New York to, uh, to Zurich, and Andreas was into about 46 or 47 cases, he uh, let me take the equipment uh, from the Schneider Needle Company, uh, the uh, exact uh, nature of which I don't think we have the time to describe, <laughs> but it wasn't exactly guidant. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so we took back the equipment uh, and brought it through customs. There was no FDA jurisdiction at the time. Customs just wanted to know how much the inflation device was worth and whether I was going to sell it. <laughs> and we waited for an ideal patient. And on the 1st of March in 1978, uh, uh, I did the first case in New York. And several hours later, uh, Myler and, and Grunzig did, uh, just fortuitously, it wasn't planned that way, they did the first case on the West Coast in San Francisco uh, on the same day. And um, then uh, Myler and Grunzik and I gradually increased the, uh, the number of people in the circle of people doing angioplasty the, uh, in the very beginning. Uh, it consisted mainly of people who were willing to dodge tomatoes and eggs <laughs> around the country. And uh, we kind of uh, bucked the establishment with, some, with something that we felt was uh, uh, so remarkably successful that it was worth the uh, non-randomized uh, enthusiasm that we had when it first started. Simon, let me, sorry, sure. let me roll you back to that. I, I can't let you gloss over the, the first cases that easily because I'm really curious about what you were worried about. You alluded to the equipment and, and what, tell us a little bit more about that and, and what, what were your concerns in, in doing those first cases? What, Set that scene. 
Well, the biggest concern that I had, and I think uh, we all had, was the uh, all-Teflon guiding catheter. The guiding catheter was one of the most dangerous interventional weapons I've ever seen. <laughs> and uh, it's all we had. It was pure Teflon, and it was uh, nine French, and it was, uh, uh, it was inflexible. And so to gain access to the coronary arteries, it was, um, uh, it was a difficult uh, and dangerous thing to do because it wasn't a flexible catheter. And uh, it was uh, of so much concern that uh, I developed a brachial guiding catheter with uh, USCI, which at that time was owned by Bard. And um, uh, that, w that brachial guiding catheter was a lot more like a Sones catheter. It was softer and it was easier to deal with, but it required the cut down going from the arm. And although there's been a whole resurgence of working from the arm under uh, circumstances that you're mostly familiar with, the radial approaches and so on, uh, it was uh, strictly competitive for a while, and it was harder to do from the arm than the Judkins technique, but it was, in a sense, a little bit safer until the guiding catheter started to improve, which happened uh, relatively quickly. But the guiding catheter was the most dangerous thing, and the most fundamentally um, primitive aspect of this, in answer to Paul's question, is that uh, we had DG and DJ catheters, which uh, were uh, um, uh, uh, appellations from the German referring to whether the tip of the catheter had a curved wire or a straight wire, because there was no over-the-wire system until John Simpson really developed that uh, with uh, ACS uh, several years later. And so uh, we would uh, enter the coronary through the guiding catheter with the balloon, and attempt to go down a native vessel with no uh, pre-wiring. And uh, that's something which no fellow today will ever uh, see again. And no fellow has seen it in, in, in the last uh, 20 years probably, and, uh, and no fellow will ever see it again, unless there are some very unusual circumstances whereby a guiding uh, wire is not used first. And so those two things were probably uh, the biggest difficulties. And in addition, the, uh, uh, the outer diameter of the balloon was uh, monstrous compared to what the profiles that are achievable today in, in a kind of commodity sense, where you could literally exist with almost any major company's balloon and do nearly the same thing. Uh, that, that clearly was not the case uh, with the original balloon catheters. The other thing you alluded to was the, the, the relationship with the surgeons, and, and that I even remember that being really colorful times. Was that a, a, a local problem for you? or No, actually, we were very lucky. We had a great deal of support from the surgeons because there was such a groundswell of interest in sending patients with coronary disease that in the first few years, Almost all of the patients that we, uh, that we had referred, we had to uh, advise that they have surgery because their disease was way too complicated for the state of the art in 1979 or 80. Uh, as you know, as time went on, the equipment and the ability to deal with complex lesions and difficult cases and poor ventricles and grafts and so on uh, be has now led to uh, an interventional cardiology uh, practice that leaves a very a relatively small number of patients going for surgery, mm -hmm. but in the beginning it actually produced more work for surgeons. Well, pick up on that, and I guess uh, kind of two related questions was how quickly did it take for the uh, cardiology community to catch on and to begin to adopt this? And what about the first patients? How hard was it to convince them that you want to try something radically new on them as a, a form of treatment? Well, I'll tell you, uh, patients, uh, uh, I, there are, in, in almost any class of patient, uh, there are enough people who are interested in uh, something special to help them so that uh, patients were more willing than we were on, on some of these patients. And remember, the inducement is really that, well, this is an experimental procedure, but if it's successful, you don't get bypass surgery, you don't get a sternotomy. So that's a lot easier than it is 